Okay, thank you very much. For everybody out here, uh, to make things easy, it may be difficult to see in the back of the room, or maybe you can't see it. There is a link at the bottom on Bitly so that you can download these slides so you don't have to take pictures, and you've got links that you can follow without having to try reading and squinting. And the link is bit.ly, which is bit.ly slash two, capital H, capital J, lowercase e, lowercase a, number three, e. So that's bit.ly slash two, capital H, capital J, lowercase e, lowercase a, three, and another lowercase e. And before I get going, there's a few things. One, I'm gonna be wandering around, so apologies to the camera crew because I'm gonna wander around because I don't like being trapped at the lectern. Second, for, the, you know, for our ASL interpreters, I talk fast, so it's gonna be difficult to keep up. So I apologize in advance, but if you can download the slides, you'll be able to check it while I'm presenting and later on. So, as you said, I've been doing uh, UX and UI design since about 1984, when I got religion about things need to be usable. Uh, I've been a double dot-com survivor. My first half of my career was in medical devices and implantable drug pumps. Uh, pulmonary ex ex and exercise stress equipment. I'm a double dot com survivor. Uh, I've also, for the last 16 years, been working for plans and providers such as my current employer, Optum Technology, but I work for Blue Cross of Minnesota. And I've been doing web for about 22 years. My accessibility experience started about 2002, and I've been full time in accessibility for roughly four and a half years. And what you're going to see is some of the stuff that I've been doing for analysis about accessibility during that time. So let's dive right in. There is a problem with accessibility, and it's the way, as you already had heard the summary, is this on this slide. The usual approach to accessibility is that no one thinks about accessibility, except people like myself, and I'm sure many of you. You're the accessibility expert, you know this, but no one else does. And it's because, as again, whoops, as I say, the accessibility comes at the end of development, by testing, by people like myself and you, that says, ooh, no one else knows how this works, we've got to call in the experts. Then, it's all found at the end, and we send these questions or these fixes to the developer. And they need our help because, again, it's magic. It's some sort of pixie dust that we sprinkle on your code to make it accessible for all the people with disabilities. And, again, it's a sort of an accessible result because there's been compromise. You did it at the end, there's no time to get it right, no one has the budget to redo it, and it's like, oh, that's just going to be too hard, we're going to go to market with this. And if you think about it, if the people that are involved or the roles, which is gonna be what we're talking about, it starts with the business owner, the person who has something they wanna to go to market with, some product that they need, who will talk to an interaction designer, and if that term's not familiar to you, that would be your user experience engineer or your usability professional. These are the people that turn those initial vague requirements into specific requirements, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail. You have the visual designer. That might be a UI designer, but the person who's looking at presentation. Then you got the content author, the person who puts all the text in there. And finally, we insert accessibility right down in here. We go from the developers to, you know, it goes from the content author to the developers, and we cycle. This is the way most people approach this, because like usability was 30 years ago, it's one of those things you're supposed to do at the end because, well, that's the way it works, right? You just change it at the end to make it accessible. Obviously, that doesn't work. So we've got to find some other way of doing it. And when I looked at this, especially when I was going through WCAG and anal analyzing it a few years ago, I started seeing that the fundamental is the assumptions. And the assumptions are, again, the way I describe the process, that developers do the work by coding accessibility using accessibility-specific knowledge and, you know, at the end of the process. So we need to question those assumptions. And that's what I was started doing. And that starts with some basic questions. Who? That's sorry, we need a little fast. Who owns and makes the, the decisions that affect your WCAG criteria? And I should take a moment that when I'm talking about success criteria, I'm going to be talking about WCAG 2, double A and single A criteria, which are 38 criteria you need to meet most of the accessibility standards that we see today. So we're going to know who owns it, and the question really is, is it the developer? That's what we assume it to be, but is that appropriate? Then when? We're trying to wait until it's coded. Is that the right time when these decisions are being made? And is it really when the coding hits? Last, what? 
Is this accessibility magic? Is it something that's accessibility specific? Is that the nature of these sorts of things? Or is it something else? Oh, I see what's going on. So let's start with that first question, who? The thing we're going to do first is deal with what are the roles that are not involved. I'm going to show you know, seven roles on that one slide. And the two that don't make decisions are those of us who would do testing. And that, when we talk about an accessibility engineer or a tester like myself, does, you're the subject matter expert. You're the one who knows WCAG. You're the one who has to understand assistive technology. You're the person that has that key information. And in that role, you typically teach other people how to pick colors, how to write text, how to make things work, fix out ARIA and other things in the world when they try to make them accessible. And that last part is that you're the one that deals with the tough things, it's like, I don't know how this works with JAWS, or how do I make that control work with Dragon, naturally speaking? And a thing that I've also found myself in, because you, no one understands this work, you get to be the user acceptance tester at the end because no one else knows whether or not it's accessible or not. A team, team member you could find is the QA tester. They're the people who do all the issues. They're the ones that test against the standard requirements. They write up the defects, and the Q is for about quality. They're the ones that enforce it. And they're the last stop before release. Well, almost. And they're not familiar with accessibility. But if you've got good testers, you can teach them how to do this. You can also include your automated testing into their automated testing. So if you work with them, you can get a lot of the support from them as well. But these are not the roles that are making the decisions. These are the roles that are making the decisions. The other five folks, and we'll talk about them in a little detail. We start with the business owner. If you're familiar with Agile, the business owner is a, f a familiar role. That's a standard uh, Agile role. That's the person who initiates the product um, process and sets some requirements, defines those, and when it's all done, says, yes, that's what I wanted. You did it right. The interaction designer is the person who talks with the business owner and, and is the liaison, takes those rough requirements that say, I need something that does this, and turns it into a set of wireframes, requirements that a developer in other roles can handle. That includes a set of wireframes, and this person should be familiar with user-centered design, user experience, and usability. That's their expertise. Next is the visual designer, and when I talk about a visual designer, that's the presentation owner. What, you know, what it looks like, and that's the style expert, the person who takes the layout, takes those rough wireframes, makes it look professional and looks you know, the way people are expecting it for that particular company. And that usually is enforced with a style guide. They write the style guide. This is how the entirety of the site should look. These are our brand colors. This is the color palette you use. The fonts are going to be like this. And because they're doing all of that for the site, we need to look at it for exceptions. So when I say design comps here, the artist, that's the one where it's like, OK, we're making a custom feature. We need to have this. Or there's a page that's different than what we currently style because everybody's innovating. There's a new feature I need, and I need to present that in a different way. So I don't have that covered in my style guide. I will do that as a design comp. And when they do all this work, they produce the image files. So they're the person or role that does that. Next is the content author, and that's the person who's in charge of all the content, large and small. Large is the big legal ease that you might see. Privacy statement, terms and conditions, long-winded text, you know, something like the American novel that's all online. It also is the tiny text. It's deciding is the standard in your company sign-in or log-in so that you're consistent. And it can also be things, do I say play and or I say start, do I say pause or stop? somebody who's enforcing the writing standards. They also do content proofreading because they're usually the ones who pay attention to it. It's like, oop, that's a misspelling, that's a typo. Um, a key thing that we'll talk about in this role is that includes the time-based media. Because if the video or your audio is not, has been prepared, and it's not uh, extemporaneous, it's not something that's done on the spur of the moment, it's not just pointing the camera out and see what goes past the window, somebody wrote a script for that. Somebody wrote the press release, somebody did something that was scripted, and that's still part of the content author role. And so there's a script writer, and just like with the visual designer who produces, produces the image files, that role is in charge of the files for the audio and video. So things like closed captioning or the supplementary script, that would be part of what they do. And last, when I talk about a developer, I'm talking about the front-end programmer the person who is doing the last work, taking all the input that came from the left 
and turns it into the deliverable product. That's the last stop of testing. And as I said, they are the ones who deal with all the defects because it's always a coding issue. Now, this isn't original work. I mean, a lot of people have done it. Here are some examples. The first one is Accessibility Responsibility Breakdown by Denis Boudreau. And as I said, we've been work working with him. You'll see his name show up towards the end. But he did it against 12 roles. There's also some other groups like Interactive WCAG from Jeremy Fields had five roles. And there was a, an article about two years ago in Simply Accessible by Mark Palmer that had six roles. And if you download the deck, you can see the links that should still work to get to these sites. The difference in the way I did this is that we did, we had decision ownership. It's not just that these roles are involved, but some of these roles actually own these decisions. It's not just that they're impacting it or that they're involved, but that they actually own these sorts of decisions. They should be constantly involved. And to do that, we look at the levels, and we're gonna be look, talking about in a moment, RACI, R-A-C-I modeling, and that's where we have levels of ownership. And we also did some additional analysis, so we looked at just beyond ownership, some of the other things that answer the other questions. Last is that we want to make sure this is actionable. We're not dealing with something that says, like, this is a nice idea, but we want to incorporate it into the processes so that we get a more accessible result. So I said RACI for RACI, or in this particular version, RASCI, R-A-S-C-I modeling. And the traditional way of doing it is R is for responsible, the person who owns the issue. A is for accountable, the responsible to the owner. Supportive is the next level down, which is, account, is not accountable, but is still helping do the work. Consulted is somebody that are there to consult about the issue, but probably have even less involved in the supportive role. And then informed. Somebody just says like, yep, they got this done. And that might be more like your program manager or a scrum master who's just making sure things are happening. The model that I'm using in this discussion is three part. You have a primary owner, the person who has, or the role that has the final approval, the person who has to sign off and say, I'm responsible for this, this is correct, it goes out. Secondary are the people that help that primary owner. You may have none, you may have everybody, depending on their actual level of activity. And last is contributor. People who you know, may be there at the start, may give you some input, but don't follow through to the end of the process. An example that's being applied, and we'll see more examples later, are that for success criterion 141, use of color, a primary owner is going to be the visual designer. They're the expert in colors. We're not going to have anybody choose the colors you know, down the stream. No, it's going to be that person because that's the things that they do, that's their profession, that's their specialty, and they're going to write that up in, typically in a style guide. Then you've got a secondary owner, an interaction designer. That, that role will be saying, I have a wireframe, we want to use color in ways of trying to identify what's going on here, and we'll leave it to you, the visual designer, to pick the particular shade. You know, it's like, yes, we're going to have errors where it should be red, but the visual designer is going to say exactly which shade of red fits in that design, and the interaction designer should be also saying, yeah, and color's not enough. The last example in this one is that the contributing person would be a business owner. And that's a case where in the selection of the colors, the business owner probably has a, brand set, a set of brand guidelines that are supposed to supersede anything for any other products. So if I'm working for 3M, I have brand guidelines, I hand it off to the visual designers who use as a starting point for the style guide for the, for the web property. So, with the definition of the five roles that make decisions and the levels, we want to ask the question, is it really the developer? And you can guess that the answer is no. And the breakdown of it is really interesting. When I did figure out this, it was really exciting because I found that instead of being the, de you know, that the developer didn't even come in first or second, came in third, that your interaction designer owns 37% of your success criteria. That's 14 out of 38. And then the content author comes in second at 24% with nine. Now that nine is large because there are five time-based media criteria in that total, but that does put them second ahead of the developer. And then you get the developer with 21% or eight success criteria. So giving all the work or all the responsibility to the developer doesn't make sense because only one in, your, in five of your success criteria are things that they actually own. And then just to finish it off, you got the vision, the visual designer, has got 16%, that's six criteria, 
and the business owner has won. So that some case where there's a success criteria in which they really are the primary driver, they have a lot of uh, the input on it. So it really emphasizes that with all these decisions being distributed and being owned by these other people, we need to make sure that they're involved in the process. Next question, when? I define six places where you would find it across the life cycle as entry points. The first is a user story, or if you're using more traditional models, the standard requirements, that initial stage when the business owner says, this is what I want. Then you have something like wireframes or other following requirements which give you a structure of the page, the interface that's in its basic terms or the interactions, how they would work. Then we get to the visual components, we get the style guides, as I mentioned, the general style presentation, the branding, the colors and logos that cover the entire site. If we have individual cases for different pages, that's where design cops come in. Then we go up to the content. That's again what I was saying. It's the text, the terminology, and your your, the scripting for your video and audio. And last but not least is the code, that front end development, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. Again, this is not entirely new. The government of Canada did this similar kind of analysis. They found seven production phases um, in their accessibility rate, responsibility breakdown. But uh, with others, we went beyond just trying to make sure how often this is done and did further analysis. So we also have the levels. We have primary, secondary, and impact. Primary, the most significant place where this entry point is when the decision gets documented. We have secondary, which are other places where it often comes in. And then we have impact, and, you know, minor places where, yeah, they could do something that affects accessibility, you know, at some other stage, but it's not the place you're going to see it the most. So we go back to the question, when does it really start with code? Say it all with me, no. When you do the analysis and you look at the primary success criteria entry points, the information is even more interesting. Wireframes account for 50% or 19 of the 38 single A and double A success criteria. User stories comes in second, and the standard requirements have got nine or 24% of your criteria ownership. Style guides comes in third with 18%, seven criteria. Code comes in fourth, 5%. Two success criteria. The code issues, and we'll see some examples, are really you know, only one in 20 or 95% of everything is not code for the entry point when the decision's made. The last two is content. There's one success criteria, we'll see it in a moment, that is 2%, and then design comps. That says zero. And the reason I say it's zero is that if you have, people, you have your designers following the style guide, your design comps should be following that. And of course, what often happens, which would be an exception to this, is a case where some new designer comes in, they don't like the colors, or things look staid and corporate, and they want to give it a new jazzy look. They violate the style guides and they introduce it. But that's a different problem. That's not the primary place where this ha would happen. Last question, what? And for that, I've broken into three types. We have stand user stories or standard requirements. These are things that you know, I define as the things that the roles would do normally. They're so basic, they're such a great best practice. If you don't tell them how to do it, they'll still do it right because that's the way everybody does it. And if you didn't change anything in the process, if you didn't train them, they're likely to do it right and it will be accessible. Next, best practices. And when I'm talking about best practices here, I'm not really talking about accessibility best practices. I'm talking about the best practices each of these roles has in their own domain knowledge. Things that UX designers know, things that visual designers know, coders and content authors. What you need to do is make sure that they, they listen to their better angels and they make sure that they adhere to these sorts of things. You, re, you want to emphasize that, yeah, this is how you write text. You need to introduce these topics when they're new and we do that right. Then last, there are going to be things that are all about accessibility things the roles don't know about you know, what they're doing and that we need to help to train. Things that an accessibility expert typically has to do to help supplement their information so that you fill in those gaps in what they don't know so you get a more accessible outcome. So we go back and ask, what is what's going on with accessibility? Are these decisions really accessibility magic and pixie dust? And say it with me, no. It's not, and the analysis here is that 
for the roles, most of the accessibility decisions for making, meeting uh, WCAG 2.0 are best practices. Not that everyone knows the accessibility best practices, but I, as a user experience person, should know most of this. As a content author, I know these sorts of things. About 40% or really 39, 15 success criteria are supplementary information, things we do need to teach other roles about accessibility. And there are about three or 8% of the success criteria that are requirements. There are a few, but not, a, not many. The key thing here is that it's not rocket surgery. It's something that we can build upon. We don't have to start from scratch with all of these folks to get them to understand what they need to do for making things accessible. So let's look at some examples. The first one is criterion 133, sensory characteristics. An example of, not, of what and how not to do is say, press the green button on the right. That's terrible. Maybe I'm colorblind. Maybe I can't see the screen to know where things are relative because I'm using a screen reader. The person who owns this is the content author. This sort of text should not happen. That's why it's listed as a never event. You should be able to just, you know, prevent that from ever happening if your content author knows not to write that. So, you know, you know the, there are no other people telling the content author what to write. It wasn't in the specs. It wasn't in the wireframes. It wasn't in the style guide. And hopefully the developer didn't try to write it because that would be delegating the responsibility of a content author to your programmer. And there are really no other contributors because the content author really owns the text and the assumption here. Then, you said, that's just accessibility knowledge. We just need to bring awareness to the content author that when you're writing this text, in addition to all the good guidelines you use, keep that in mind that your audience may not be able to pick this out, so write your instructions in a way that is accessible to all. And eventually, that could become a best practice. They just add it to their writing guidelines. And when does it come in? Content. It comes, in very, it comes in there before the developer gets it because the developer is going to take what you give them. It's going to come from the content management system. It's going to be in an email or however the content is written out. Next criterion, 221, timing adjustable. And that's going to be the case where I have to log in. I need my information protected. So I'm going to have a, something on the screen such as session times out in five minutes. Do you want to continue? Yes or no? This is the criterion that we can't, I think of as being owned by the business owner. No one wants to code this. From an accessibility standpoint, one of the options is turn this off. But you've got the business owner saying, no, I have business requirements, I have legal requirements, I have the way it's done in the industry, I need it done this way, and they will say I have to do this as a feature. That's the primary owner driving it. And then you have the secondary you know, owner on here, is the interaction designer who thrashes that out with the business owner and says, okay, this is what we need to do, and this is how we'll do it. We'll say five minutes, and they, are, they can haggle over that, but they decide that this is how the feature is going to be done. Now, this isn't talking about the dialogue and making sure that's accessible. That's a separate discussion. It's a matter of defining the feature that you're going to make sure you can extend the session and that it's defined there. And this is... You know, it's like you don't have too many cases where people are going to get away with trying to do it. It's almost a standard requirement. You could still say it's a best practice, and that's safe, but again, they will typically try to do this because the business owner says, yeah, I hate it when they, you know, it's like I was in there, I went, stepped away, got myself a cup of coffee, everything looked fine, I pushed submit, and it says, you've been logged out, and I lost all my work. They don't like it any more than anyone else does. And when did that come in? The requirements in the user story. So this is one of the rare cases when it's a standard requirement, one of those three, but it, and it's also a rare case where it's the business owner, but this is where you know, the ownership is not in the hands of the developer. Next, 245, multiple ways, and that's when you're deciding how you can navigate different, you know, the site in different ways. Do you have site search? Do you have a site map? Breadcrumb trails, top nav, in-page links. Do you have links all for all the pages because your site's so small that each page has links to all the other pages? The acceptable techniques for meeting with this particular criterion. This is usually owned by your interaction designer. And if you're an interaction designer who's been following the literature, this falls under the term, the scent of information. Something that was written up years ago about some people like to browse. That's the way they want to do things. Or if I go to Amazon, browsing is going to be impossible. I'm just going to type in a few words and see what I get. They talk about it in those general terms, but accessibility and this criterion say it's got to be there. 
And so you have these kinds of discussions saying, well, how are we going to put that in there? Now, I don't have any other secondary contributor roles, but you could say that maybe the business owner is going to have to find the budget to put in a search engine. That might fit, if, depending on your model or you know, what you have for your infrastructure, but that's where it comes in. This is one of many criteria which the interaction designer owns. Next, color contrast, 143. Contrast, color contrast minimum. Bad example from my experience with all the sites, companies that I have which use blue, blue on light blue. This, yeah, I said, when you're at Blue Cross, everything's blue, and it, sometimes it's difficult to get them to understand this issue. But this is, again, a visual design question. It's exactly which shade of blue, and making sure the visual designer who has the say, because they are the brand police, they know how to get it right. No one else is going to have too much to say about it, other than maybe the business owner, as I mentioned. The, the visual designer, say it's an outside agency, needs the brand book to know what the starting point is. And so the business owner is going to hand that off and then leave them alone because they're not the design experts. They don't have the BFA or any of the degrees that say this is the way to do things. What is it from the type? It's accessibility. I, as a visual designer, probably don't know anything about accessibility unless I've lived it. And eventually, again, it should become a best practice, something that's happening that I get used to doing and it becomes standard equipment. But I need to get to that point where I know that. Where does it enter? Style guide. But the things we'll be talking about is that the style guide is where a lot of requirements that can Im impact accessibility are logged and need to be addressed. And if they're doing design comps and somebody picks a new shade of blue that's not in the palette and needs to be changed, that's another place where it happens. That's not the primary one. The style guide should rule. And that's some of the assumptions. Last, 411 parsing. An example of this is missing alt attribute in an image tag. Primary owner is the, the developer. Nobody told him not to put the, attri the attribute in there. It wasn't in the requirements, the style guide, or anything else. It isn't part of content. The alt text might have been, but the key thing I want to point out is that this is not talking about from an accessibility standpoint. I'm referring to this as this is the HTML standard. When you run the code through a validator and it knows nothing about accessibility, it says, Every image tag is supposed to have an alt attribute. So if they run it through the code validator, it should find that and flag it and something has to be added. Mainly, you've got to put an alt attribute. What you set it to, different discussion, but it needs to be there. And that doesn't happen until the developer writes the code. And identifying those things is a best practice. In an ideal world, the developer does this. It's part of your design process. You make it part of check-in, or you do it part of the build, that they will do this normally. Unfortunately, <laughs> we've had cases where developers don't think that's the case. In fact, some of my colleagues did a great presentation where just running a code validator can fix a lot. And I think they want to say almost 90% of accessibility errors. This is one of the key things about validating the code. You get developers to say, HTML5 paved all the cow paths, so any code is valid. No, your tables aren't going to work. This will fail. And these are coding standards, making developers write to the standards that were written by the W3C. So what does this mean when you have this analysis, and how do you apply it to change the status quo? Well, first of all, it gives us an opportunity to improve efficiency and quality for new and existing sites. I'll get into that in a moment. It also is talking about the shift left concept. We have the ability to get involvement happening well early in the parts of the design process. And it's a case where we can distribute the ownership and assignments across the system. We're going to have it to roles other than developers and testers. And we can, since we have the information, we can tailor the information about accessibility to that. We know who you are, we know what you know, we know what you need to know, and so we can try filling in those gaps because we have a you know, definition of what you have to know and we can focus it on there and write it in a way that makes sense for you. Another place that it happens is if you're doing accessibility checklists. One of the things you do is you look at your checkpoints and you identify, say, okay, if the color contrast fails, I don't send it to the developer and they pick the color, I send it to the visual designer. And that changes the process. And you get that stuff done earlier in the process. 
What it means to accessibility testers is that you're distributing the issues and remediations to the other roles means that the team becomes more self-sufficient. They don't need you so often. They're not sending you emails. They're not texting you. They're not chatting with you saying, I don't know, what do I do about this? The design roles themselves prevent the issues because they're finding them at the start. And ideally, as they get more mature with it, they're finding these issues. In fact, it gets to the point where, depending on how much cross-pollination, they start finding things before you do. They will find it, they'll return it, and they'll say, yeah, oh yeah, I noticed that color contrast was right, wasn't quite right, so I went back to the designer and they had it picked. Also, if you get that training into your testers, as I said, they can do a lot of this work because it's not rocket surgery. You just need to have requirements because testers will follow a script. If you can define things in a script that they can follow, they'll follow it too. What that does for us as testers is that frees us up to deal with the difficult issues that they're never going to understand. Again, I have to make this work with a screen reader, or how come ARIA label doesn't work with Dragon, and things like that. And the net result is that you reduce the number of accessibility experts that you need across the enterprise. And that's important for companies like the one I work for, where you can have hundreds of sites. If you use a traditional model where I'm going to embed a consultant or a consultant in there, it doesn't scale. Let's just say for if I have 300 sites and I'm going to assign one expert for a half an expert per site, I will need 150 engineers to deal with all of them. There's not enough people <laughs> in this profession to do that. So we've had to look for ways to make it that scalable and distribute the, the load to the people that are making decisions and ultimately have to be making decisions so they do it more intelligently. And that's where we get to the shift left. So let's start with looking at what happens with new projects. We, instead of having accessibility injected at the end, we accept and insert accessibility throughout the process. Everybody gets informed about what's going on. And you know, what it happens with new projects, we integrate accessibility early in the design process. And we can make things that are assigned the ownership to the different decision makers. And we can do role-based training that you know, gives them the refresher on what they need to know to, again, follow their better angels. And accessibility training, supplementing it so that they have that gap fill that they need. And here's an example starting with, where would you apply a shift left for requirements? Timing adjustable, we've already talked about that. When the business owner comes in, it's like you can say, you identify the need, they work out which approach is going to work, well, the different ways, depending on what the site is structured, what can you afford, what are you going to do? Multiple ways, touched on that also. It's the uh, multiple ways, which way are you gonna do a site search or not? Do you do a site map or not? and making sure that they've got the thing that fits the situation and work it out. All at the requirement phase. You're not waiting for it until the, um, you get to the final phases and you bring it up for us as testers to find. Okay, wireframes. These two are, that I didn't discuss before, 243, focus order. Identifying how the keyboard focus is gonna move across the screen. You can document that sequence in a wireframe. And you, when you describe like the general look of a page, you can start putting it so it follows the order. Get your interaction designer to put that in. They can put it as a basic overview. If they have a custom page with a specific way, like you have a custom component, they can define it there as well. Similarly, for 246, headings and labels, and its new relationship with uh, 131, info and relationships, which is defining that not only do you have headings, but you're gonna use an H tag to define them. You can get that documented in your wireframes so that you have the heading levels and you confirm that the, their hierarchy and the nesting is done correctly. And you can do that on the page and, and on there, or if you find content, like a you know, for table of contents, again, for long content pages, privacy statements, terms and conditions, I may need to have a secondary navigation, and you can find it there for the developers. So they're not picking these things. So if you have those like, definitions, and I can tell you that this is an approach that I learned you know, last year is being done at Wells Fargo. When, they do, when the UX designer hands off the requirements, this is baked into the wireframes. They come up with their own process. Unfortunately, I can't share that with you, but this is one of the things that they do to get the decisions made and baked in early in the process. Style guides. Um, touching on one of them, we've said style guides, like contrast minimum. You get the combinations, the style guide will just naturally say, these are the ones we do. They bake in the accessibility of the contrast in there, and people are supposed to follow it just like they pick the right shade of blue or red. 
and those will be an accessible sort that you can test using a color contrast analyzer while it's still a, a you know, Photoshop document, or however they communicate it. The next one, two, three, one, three flashes are below threshold. This is one where you put in the style guide and you say, don't use the blink tag. When you create animation, don't do, flash, don't do flashing, don't have strobe effects. Or maybe if you have an animation, you have a loading graphic, the style guide says it should be dim, it should be this size. You can say what the standard is in the style guide so you're not finding these things at the end and say, oh my God, we gotta change that. How do we get that into production? Writing guide. This is you know, for content authorship. Sensory characteristics, already talked about that, where you have the inform the authors that, yeah, in addition to the guidelines you already know, make sure that you write it in a way that's inclusive, that I don't have to be able to pick out color or know a position visually. The next one is, is I bring up, because it's like there are writing standards that they're technically AAA, and that's what 313 unusual words, 314 abbreviations, and 315 reading level, these are AAA. But if you go into content authorship, if you look at things like the Chicago Book of Style, this is standard stuff. Your content author as a professional should already know these things. They may already be doing these things. In fact, in doing my research internally, we had an initiative. I can map these directly to our writing guidelines. Now, maybe not everybody knows about them, but they're aligned. So Let's make sure we could try to bring that to bear, that we're doing corporate standards which happen to take us beyond just double A. So that was new products, but most of us are dealing with existing products. How do we change the process there? Well, as I mentioned, we kick the issue back to the role that it belongs. We're not doing design, we're not doing content authoring between testing and developers. If we have a content issue, we send it to the content author. If it's a design issue for a presentation, visual designer. If there's a question of how it should function, we go back to the interaction designer. So what does it do for a triage of existing sites? Like with the new projects, we want to make sure that all the roles know that they have, that they have the training. We need to get them informed so that when we give them that issue, when they assign the defect to that role they've never heard of doing, it's like, wow, I need to know about your debug tracking software? Yeah, you might be involved, that they know what to do. And again, we assign it to the right people. We don't spend the, have the developers writing text, picking colors, or trying to figure out what it should be at the last minute. We want to get it to the roles and that do it, and over time, they will start to learn that, yeah, we're gonna have to know this, and the next time I'll do it better. When it comes to shift left, that means when you pick the team to do that remediation, it's not testers and developers alone. You need to include your designers and the content authors, maybe the business owner if it's you know, got some problems, but you need to make sure they're on the team. I've been on projects where it's like, yeah, what should we put in for the text? It's like, I can suggest, but I'm not your content author. I, you don't want me picking your colors. I don't know your brand guidelines. I don't know how your text is done. I'm not sure what your standards are. You need to go to the person who did that because someone wrote that text. Hopefully it wasn't the developer, but you had a role that knew what was, they were doing and they do that. As I mentioned, if you are having a checklist, you analyze your checkpoints. You identify the owner that you will send it to and you'll, you can make sure that your developers and testers don't do the design. So you could get a case where color contrast. I have a color contrast issue. If it was designed right in the style guide, then, then the developer had a typo. But if it was wrong in the style guide, you don't want the developer picking the color. That won't get in the style guide, it doesn't get updated. It has to be done again and again. You need to make sure the right owner handles it and it gets updated where necessary. So, that's what was going on before, and since I've done these presentations over the years, there is a bit of a future. The starting point, as I mentioned, Denis Boudreau, and since I did this presentation at CSUN a year ago, we've I've become part of a team that's an offshoot of the Education and Outreach Working Group of the W3C. It got approved this past March at CSUN, and we are, I'm part of a team with Denis Boudreau from DQ, uh, co my coworker Scott Sean Kelly, and Denise's co you know, co-worker, Caitlin, at DQ. And what we are working out is a three-year plan to take this to the world by you know, identifying deliverables like a decision tree. If you need to apply these sorts of things, we are coming up with a process and we're gonna define a way that you can follow it and you can apply it to your own needs. I mean, I when I talk about these roles, 
that may not reflect the way you do your work. You may have different roles. Some of these may have been combined. Maybe they're split apart, but you need a way of doing it and everybody's is different. So we're gonna give you, we're trying to work out a way of giving you the tree so you can apply it to success criteria, primarily for new work, and to your checklist so you can apply it to remediation. And we're looking for input. My contact information will be at the end, and we're looking for input. If you're really excited, maybe you can join the team. Otherwise, you know, you can follow this information as we start to publish it. Things you can do now, as I said, working, Denis and Kaylin have already got things for your UX designers. After the testers, the UX designers who know about user-centered design, who it, it basically, if, they, if you have a UX designer who doesn't consider that everybody, inclusive design, is user-centered for everybody, then you need to have a conversation with them because they should already be doing or knowing these sorts of things. But it's daunting. You now, Denis and Caitlin have done work at, through DQ. You can download right now. One of them is uh, it's a blog post about shift left. It's a two-part blog. That's bit.ly slash two capital I zero capital O three R capital Y. Again, if you download the deck, I also tweeted it out before you can get that. Probably the most valuable one, though, is they started releasing heuristics. If you're, so if you're a user experience person, you know that heuristics have been around a long time. In fact, they go back to the 1980s. What they did, if you download this six-page document, is that you're gonna find no mention of WCAG, but you're gonna see 10 heuristics, rules on how to make things accessible, written in a, in a way that UX designers understand. They don't need to know WCAG, they don't need to how to spell normative or things that are part of WCAG speak, but that's part of what's in there. And that's at, B, at bit.ly, a11y dash heuristics, all lowercase. Again, it's a little difficult to do this and I'm probably running out of time, but that's something you can download now. Also, WCAG 2.1 is coming out later this summer. And I can tell you, having done some preliminary analysis, all those percentages are pretty much unchanged. The, it changes just a little bit, but the number of items that the developer impacts decreases slightly. It's a little, it doesn't really change from one in five ownership or other things like that, but it really doesn't get me even more significant. Interaction visual designers, they get more responsibility. Content authors and business owners, not really substantively changed. And so that's what it is for the information I have to share with you. And here's my contact information. I'll be here through the rest of the night. Um, and so if you want to have questions for me, you can find me uh, online, btyler at optum.com, that's O-P-T-U-M.com, or at Bill Tyler on Twitter. Thank you.